talking about the baptism of Jesus today. And we're intentionally taking these next few weeks to focus on the lectionary readings. Crystal talked about them a little bit last week, but basically there's a calendar of readings set up throughout the year. And so uh, for most of, of my time here, I have been ignoring that and just preaching on whatever I want. And so you'll, their readings have nothing to do with what I end up talking about. And so today we're going to uh, become more aware of these connections that are happening in these lectionary readings and then also uh, preach on the, the lectionary te- text for that day so it, it makes sense. Real, a real quick overview of the lectionary. Every week we have a psalm reading. So we heard that Psalm 29 about the mountains and the thunder and the God's voice and all that. So we've read that together. We have an Old, old, old Testament reading. And uh, so the psalm and the Old Testament reading both come from the Old Testament. Often the Old Testament reading will be from one of the, the prophets. Uh, today we heard from Isaiah, who is one of the prophets. So you could hear from Genesis maybe in those Old Testament readings. Basically, if you take your Bible and go like this, this is all Old Testament and this is New Testament. There's much more here in the Old Testament. So we hear two Old Testament readings there. We hear an epistle reading. That's where we heard Romans. Epistle just means letters. I, we have to have a fancy word to sound important, I guess. But there are basically uh, letters from early church leaders to the church as they have planted. We heard from Paul. We heard a letter that he wrote to the church in Rome that he started and has yet to visit. So this is a, a satellite church that lives out there in Rome, and he is going, uh, sending letters of encouragement and and instruction and training to these to these people. So in the psalm, we 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 get a a feeling uh, through poetry and through artful expression uh, what it what it means to live a life. There'll be psalms of praise, thanking the Lord for what He's done. There'll be psalms of lament, where they're singing the blues. You know what I'm saying? So they, they're, all these things exist there. It's an artful expression of, of living a life under the Lord. The Old Testament reading today, we had a, pro- a prophetic reading. And often these are written to uh, a word from God telling the people what is to come or warning them of what is to come. So there are warnings and there their invitations to continue to follow the Lord. Our gospel reading, the gospels are the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that have all the Jesus stuff in them. All the stuff about Jesus walking around and being a baby and being baptized, that all happens in the gospel. And so we get to experience what Jesus' ministry and life was through four different perspectives by four different authors telling their stories of what they experienced through Jesus here on earth. And that epistle reading, the letter to the Romans, for example, is people trying to understand how do you live your life then? Now that Jesus has been here and died and resurrected, now what do we do? And so these epistle readings are uh, trying to teach the people that lived at that moment how to live in the light of a resurrected Jesus. What does that mean for their lives? So the lectionary, I want to talk a little bit about what I think is, is good about it. It covers a majority of Scripture, So through a three-year time period, you're going to hear most of the Bible. And so that's good because if you just ignore the lectionary, then I could end up preaching on John 3, 16, you know, 20 weeks in a row or something. So this keeps you honest. It, it, It helps you understand the whole breadth of Scripture and not just the preacher's favorite passages. Uh, There's a lot of history here in the lectionary. These lectionaries have been uh, devised over years and years of careful biblical study, I have scholarship up here. Meaning that oftentimes these connections we hear, uh, Isaiah connecting with the baptism of Jesus all the way in the Gospels. And then Paul talking to the Romans about what this, our baptism means then. All this is careful scholarship and these lectionary readings are chosen carefully and prayerfully to help guide us and see these connections, to connect all the dots to help us uh, become more aware of, of how this entire narrative is stitched together. So there are a couple good things about the lectionary, the not so good things, and this is Pastor 
PJC's opinion. That's me, Pastor Jason Christensen again. So, uh, they're not so good. My opinion. You get the readings out of context. And what do I mean? What I mean is we heard from Paul speaking to the Romans, but if you don't know who Paul is or who the Romans are or why he's writing to them, then it can become confusing what he's saying. Oftentimes this happens when uh, you, get the, you get the reading that I remember a couple weeks, uh, a couple months ago we had the reading of, a woman must remain silent in church, blah, 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 that whole thing, you know? And I can't remember who was reading, but it was a woman. It was, I, I must remain silent. She didn't say I write, but you, a woman must remain silent. And uh, well, I'm not silent, so I've broken the rules, you know? So you get these things out of context. And that's sort of my job to put them in context, but it's a lot of work to stitch four things together. So, it's, so, <laughs> so you, you get them out of context. And here's a good example. Do we have anyone that loves film, movies? No one likes movies in Fairfield. One, Alice, you're from Cedar Rapids, though. <laughs> Fairfield's not a movie town. Well, where I was born, we liked movies. And there's this thing called movies. It used to be 90 minutes, now they're like four hours. But they're movies that you can watch. And one of the, the uh, greatest feats of cinema history was a movie called Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Have you ever seen this one? <laughs> That's, that's Pee Wee Herman. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's one of the greatest. Kids, ask your parents. Grandparents, ask your kids. Pee uh, Wee's Big Adventure. And so if I were to say to you, pull this scene out of context and say, here's Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the greatest um, movie in, in cinema history, you would say, oh, well, Pee Wee's Big Adventure is about a guy uh, in a gray suit and a red bow tie that loves clowns. Like, that's not true. You would miss the whole point that this is actually setting up a disastrous situation where, spoiler alert, Pee Wee Herman's bicycle is about to be stolen. You see it there at the bottom, and he's tied it up to this clown, hoping that it remains safe. So Pee Wee Herman actually doesn't like clowns. You miss the whole point because it's, because it's taken out of context. Pee Wee Herman, anyone? You know him. I know you do. <laughs> that's that's, that's Pee Wee. So it's out of context, and, and that gives me uh, heartburn sometimes when I hear stuff out of context because it can be taken the wrong way, and, and lives have been ruined out of taking the Bible out of context. Uh, communities of millions of people have been uh, murdered because biblical passages have been taken out of context, and so I don't like that. Uh, it, it makes me weep for the church on the whole, that we pull these things out of context to make them say what we want in order to do the things that we want to do. And the uh, one other thing that's not so good about the lectionary readings, it's people put this together. It's not the Bible. And it does have history and scholarship behind it, so they're well-meaning, very smart people that are smaller, smarter than me and know much more than I do, and prayerful, probably better people than I am, and pray more than I do, so I'm not saying anything about their character. But what I'm saying is it's an interpretation. They decide, well, this verse in Isaiah definitely connects with this verse in Matthew, so we're going to stick them together. It's quite probable that they do, but again, it's not biblical, it's, it's their interpretation of what it means. And so our lectionary readings were Psalm 29, written around 1000 BC. Our Old Testament reading was Isaiah. This was written around 700 BC. So there's 300 years between them. Our epistle readings, the, the, the letter to that church in Rome was written around 55 AD, 20 or so years after Jesus has, has died and resurrected. And our gospel reading was written right around 60 AD. So these gospels and these letters are all kind of being written around the same time in various areas around the Middle East over there. And so there's a lot here to, to connect together. And we have to be aware of, of doing this carefully. But it also helps us see the awareness of God working through thousands of years and it being documented for us here. So we're going to uh, talk a little bit about Pee-wee's Playhouse. 
This is the day I get fired. I'm just telling you that right now. <laughs> this is my Pee Wee's Playhouse lunchbox. <laughs> Pee Wee's Playhouse, if you don't know, the Pee Wee Herman, the one who was in the greatest movie in cinema history, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, had his own TV show, which is the greatest TV show in the history of television, called Pee Wee's Playhouse. This is a lunchbox I had. I loved Pee Wee Herman very much. I loved Pee Wee's Playhouse very much. You know, this lunchbox, when I dug this out, let's look here, I still have the thermos. <laughs> There's probably like moonshine in here by now or something. I don't, I don't know, that's probably all right. <laughs> so I, I still have the thermos. One of the cool things about Pee Wee's Playhouse is he had this little screen sitting next to him called Magic Screen, and he would jump into the Magic Screen and do this thing called Connect the Dots, and he'd sing this song, Connect the Dots, la, 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 la. I can't do impressions, but you know what I'm saying? He'd throw these dots out and connect them, and they'd become a boat or a helicopter, and he'd jump into the boat and fly off. He's connecting the dots here, and so this is now Pastor Jason's sermon. <laughs> We're going to connect the dots. Okay. Right? It's Pee Wee. We're going we're gonna, to uh, connect. I told you I'm getting fired today. This, uh, we're going we're gonna to connect the dots here. This is Pastor Jason's sermon. I won't wear this the whole time, I promise. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the psalm. The psalm had many verses. One of the verses I want to I want to point out is this verse here. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. So we hear hear expressions of God's uh, strength and and powerfulness in his in the God's voice. We hear mention of of waters. Waters are water is very Im important. Especially at that time, water was uh, life-giving as it is to all of us, but water was also chaotic and scary. If you've ever been to the ocean, especially on a stormy day, it's, you, if you try to walk out there, there's no hope for you, right? I mean, you, that water pushes you back, and it's dangerous. So thousands of years ago, when we didn't quite have a full understanding of what the globe looked like and that sort of thing. The water were just endless infinity of chaos and destruction. And so we hear that God's voice is over the waters. That God is more powerful than those waters here in this psalm. That's, what, that's one, of the, one of the things we're reminded of. There's lots of dots for uh, Pastor Jason to connect here, but this is just one of them. That God's voice is above those chaotic waters. We hear that in Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is one of the longest books in the Bible. And this portion of it is often called one of the servant songs. Isaiah is also full of poetry. And that verse in Isaiah that we heard is, Here's my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Isaiah's role in the Bible and in his life was to be a prophet, to speak words from God to people, to help them get back on track or help them uh, remember what's important in their lives. And Isaiah has a word from God that God is going to send a servant, someone in whom he delights, that will have the spirit of God on him. And so we all know, especially here after Christmas, who he's talking about. But this is words of prophecy, and we're connecting dots from God's voice over the waters and God's uh, spirit on his servant. And this is our gospel reading for today. This is from the book of Matthew, and this is uh, talking about Jesus' baptism. We're going to meet here John the Baptist, who is, uh, we learn in the Bible, is a cousin of Jesus. And John the Baptist is out baptizing people, hence the name John the Baptist. And Jesus comes to him to be baptized. And John says, whoa, I know who you are. You know who I am. I shouldn't be baptizing you. 
So we'll read this a little bit. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, Then John consented. He said, all right, Jesus, let's do this thing. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You start to see the dots connect here. A verse we can focus on, as soon as Jesus was baptized, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God. My son in, in whom I'm well pleased. These are the same echoes of the same words that we heard in that verse of Isaiah. We start to become aware that over thousands of years, something is happening here, and we're seeing the culmination of it. We're seeing the culmination of what uh, the psalmist said in that, uh, in that prayer, in that poem, We see the culmination of what Isaiah was talking about in 700 B.C. here, 700 years later, in the baptism of Jesus. And so after all that's done, now we're to Romans, where Paul is trying to instruct people on how to live their lives in the light of this baptism of Jesus that we just talked about. And so one of the things that Paul says to them is, we were therefore buried with him through baptism, He's linking our baptisms to Jesus' baptism. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order uh, order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Paul is uh, connecting some dots here for us. And he's uh, making us aware that We have been baptized just like Jesus was baptized. In that baptism, we are created anew. We are dead to the old way we live, and we are raised to life just like Jesus was raised to live a new life. So, Not only do these scriptures have uh, connect the dots through all of them to tell a biblical story about Jesus and God and God working in the lives of God's people. It also connects the dots of our life with the life of Jesus. We begin to have an awareness of of what this means to us. We begin begin to have an awareness of how important it is that we for ourselves read these things and struggle with them and try our best to connect these dots on our own. And so, Paul has made one connection for us, and I want to make a couple more of how these tie together. Help us become a little bit more aware of what these four scripture readings mean for our lives here in Fairfield, where we don't watch movies. (laughs) So, sorry. So, uh, so, uh, one, one of the things that we can learn from this is by surrendering to Jesus, we receive God's grace. Either by our decision to be baptized or by our parents' decision or our guardians, our caretakers' decision to have us baptized. That's when we enter into God's grace. And you say, well, Pastor Jason, do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? And I'll say, that's not what we're talking about today. But, (laughs) but, (laughs) But this is one of the ways that we receive God's grace is through baptism. All who believe and are baptized will be saved, Jesus promises us. He promises this to us. And so by surrendering to Jesus through our our own actions or through the actions of those that make decisions for our lives, uh, we surrender to Jesus and we receive God's grace as we take part in a baptism just like Jesus' baptism, we receive God's grace to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus says to John the Baptist, we have to do this. And John says, I don't want to do this because you're Jesus and I'm just John. And Jesus says, we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? 
To fulfill righteousness means to submit to God's plan. It's for John to say, I don't feel comfortable with this. And it's for Jesus to say, this is God's plan. And for them together to to do this thing that John uh, is uneasy with. To fulfill righteousness is to submit to God's plan. And so that's the same thing for us. It's the same thing for us. It's we need to listen for the, for the voice of God in our lives. We need to become aware of his presence in our lives. And we hear in the psalm, the voice of the Lord uh, echoes, thunders over the waters and, and all that. I don't have the psalms memorized, but the voice of the Lord uh, thunders over the waters. And we say to ourselves, well, I would submit to God's plan if God would just uh, thunder his voice, please. Thank you. Thunder it. Thunder, please. But psalms are poetry and they're metaphorical. And so God doesn't thunder his, God's voice in the way that we want God to. God thunders God's voice in the way that God wants to. And so sometimes that is silently. That is when we try to become aware of God's presence in our lives, then we can hear God's voice thunder. One of the things that I struggle with is my iPhone always and my email and my text and, and uh, I like to pretend that I'm a busy, important person so I'm constantly, oh, I gotta check this thing and log into this thing and you know. And through that process of busyness, I become less aware of who I am. I become less aware of who God is. I become less aware of God's presence in my life and so God can thunder all he wants. But if I'm distracted and self-important and doing the things that I think I should be doing and not submitting to God's plan, then I don't hear God's voice. And so uh, I encourage you to find the way that, that God speaks to you. It's about God will speak to you in the language that you need to hear. And so Jesus and John fulfill God's righteousness uh, by submitting to God's plan. And we can do the same. We can fulfill righteousness uh, by submitting to God's plan in our lives, by becoming aware of, of his presence in our lives. It's not easy. We've been programmed and told that we have to have devices and this sort of thing, so it becomes harder and harder for us. But God is there, and God's voice thunders if we become aware of him. And so another thing that connects these readings then, these dots to our lives, is that what looks like an obstacle may actually be God's call. John didn't want to walk in the water. Uh, John saw the Son of God coming into the water, and God said, I'm not, and John said, I'm not going in there. I don't want any part of this. I'm not getting in the water. One of the great things about, uh, about seeing this from John and Jesus is that then we have an opportunity to say, well, what are we not stepping into? As we're going our, through our lives and trying to fulfill all righteousness and submit to God's plan and receive God's grace, and we say, well, there's water there. That's scary. I'm going to go try to go around it. I don't, I don't want to go in the water and you're lost here. And you say, God, show me what to do. And God says, wade in the water. You say, I don't want to wade in the water. That's scary. I don't want to go there. So you walk around and you say, God, why aren't you telling me what to do? And God says to you, I need you to get in the water. This is the plan, to get in the water. I know that when you look at this water, you're scared to death. I know that you're walking along and everything's going well in your life. And you come against this water and you say, this can't be God's plan for me because that looks scary. This can't be God's plan for me because it's not my plan. This can't be God's plan for me because I never saw this coming a mile away. I had no idea this water was there. I must have taken a wrong turn. Maybe I didn't listen to God. Let me try a different path. So I understand the fear. I understand the uncertainty. 
when your life is going as you like it to go, and there's water in the way, you get a, a phone call from a doctor that you don't like. I, I understand that. You get a phone call from a parent with horrible news. You get a phone call from the school. You uh, are forced to make a decision on where you're going to work. You're forced to make a decision on all of these things in our lives. And we approach this water and it's so scary that we can't see a way forward. And God is saying to you, go through the water. It's the only way to get to the other side. This is my plan. This is my plan for you to go through the water. And you say, God, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. And that's when you have to remember that we heard that God's voice thunders over the water. We heard that the spirit descended like a dove and we heard that Jesus was in the water because God is present in the water. The very thing that you try to avoid that looks like an obstacle to you is where God's presence is. God is present here too, but God is also present here. God's not gonna lead you on a plan and say, okay, I'll meet you on the other side. I'm God, I can fly over it or whatever. <laughs> He says, no, God is present in the water. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense because this water is, try not to swear, this water is no good. I don't like this water. How can you be in something so scary and so horrible? How can you be in something that's going to derail my life? How can you be in something that I don't understand? I can't see the other side. This water is certain death for me. I don't understand how you can be in the water. And that's when we say, we just saw last week that God was here, that God is with us. God came as a baby to be with us so that when God says, go through the water, I'm right here, you say, how can that be? And you say, I just showed you. I just showed you that I'm here. You have to trust me. You have to listen to my call. You have to understand that what looks to you uh, like scary and chaos and what looks to like to you to be a roadblock is the path and I'm in the path. I am here. I am taking this journey with you. What you think is the end is not the end. What you think is the path is not the path. What you think my plan for you is not the plan. My plan is so much better. Get in the water with me. So I invite you this morning to get in the water. I don't know what that looks like. It looks different for all of us. Uh, to some of us, it's just making a phone call to someone that we don't like to talk to. Some of us have bigger issues. But the water's here. And what looks like a roadblock is God inviting us into the water. Amen? Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, it's hard to thank you uh, for the water in our life because it's scary. It's hard to know uh, which way to turn. And so, Lord, we ask you for the strength. We ask you for the faith to get in the water. We ask you to make us more aware of your presence in the water. Lord, we invite your spirit here, as in the water of baptisms, to be in our lives, to make us more aware of what you're doing, to help us have ears to hear your voice thundering in our lives. Lord, we invite your presence. Make us more aware of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.